Okay. Um, well, first minute, I'm so excited to be here. I just want to say, um, you know, sometimes when you hear your biography read, you just sit back and you say, praise God. Because you remember five years before then, 10 years before then, when you sat in an audience, and you really strive to be standing before an audience such as yourself and be able to be on the microphone. And so one of the things that I always say is that I never take anything for granted because all of this is stuff that goes in your life story of how you got there. And so I just really want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation um, for their leadership and their continued support. And I actually want to let them know something. I don't know if they already know this. So the histories of Walker's legacy I'll get to in a second, but I want to let the CBCF know that the reason why I'm an entrepreneur today is because the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation took a bet on me. Yes. I started my first company at the age of 26 years old. It was a consultancy. And my very first client was the CBCF. And I wrote a book for them called The Pursuit of Entrepreneurship, A Guide for African American Entrepreneurs. It was released in 2009. And it was part of the 2009 Congressional Black Caucus uh, Summit Activities, a ALC or ACL, uh, in Washington, DC. And I had gone to go meet uh, with members of the team, and I said, you know, we really need to be advancing this conversation around entrepreneurship, and not just from the perspective of government contracting. And so I had come, my uh, professional background has been in the nexus of entrepreneurship, uh, business, and uh, I'm sorry, entrepreneurship, government, and nonprofit. And so I was doing economic development in the District of Columbia. And anybody that knows D.C. knows there's a tale of three D.C.s. There's Washington, D.C., the district, D.C., the nation's capital. There's international D.C., and then there's the hill of D.C. And I worked for D.C., D.C. And it was an exciting time. And I mean, Mr. Peebles is obviously someone who I looked up to uh, very much so as well throughout my career. But to get to the next level, I had to pledge for it. Now, I'm a Delta, and I think we have a few Deltas in here, and I just, you know, I won't leave it to fate that we're in a room full of red and white. But I wanted to get this opportunity. But to take that jump from D.C. to national D.C. is not just a walk across the street. It's not. It, it is literally, but it really is not. And so I actually volunteered my services. And I worked with the CBC and the CBCF helping to put together the initial conference. But I never gave up faith that I might be able to get that first contract, and I did. And it came really just two or three weeks before the conference. So I want to thank you all for giving birth to Walker's legacy, and you didn't even know it. So this is what's really exciting. So please, give the CBC a round of applause. So I'm here to talk about my journey, but really I want to talk about some women who have been absolutely instrumental in this cause for which we are here today, which is around black female entrepreneurship and access to capital. I have a couple of women whose names I'm going to read out, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the legacy. Because the truth of the matter is entrepreneurship for African American women is nothing new. It's nothing that we are just now getting into the game around. It is something that we have done since the moment that we came into this country. Okay, and so these women, like Annie Malone, does anybody know who Annie Malone is? Walker's legacy is named for Madam C.J. Walker, but the truth of the matter is there was another woman named Annie Malone who was actually the mentor to Madam C.J. Walker and helped to teach her how to run a sales, a nationally networked sales company. But for connection with Annie Malone, we don't know who Madam C.J. Walker would have been. So as we talk in here today about building networks, it's so critical to understand that every woman has had another strong woman standing either alongside her or right in front of her, helping to lead her down the path that she needs toward success. Annie Malone was also a mega millionaire for her time, a boss woman who had her own fur coat and her own car, had her own beauty schools. We know about Madam C.J. Walker, again, for whom Walker's legacy was named. But do we know who Maggie Walker was? Does anybody know who Maggie Walker was? Maggie Walker, as we stand in this room today to talk about access to capital, was the first 
female in the United States of America to become the chairwoman and the CEO of a financial institution in this nation. Her name was Maggie Walker, and her bank was in Richmond, Virginia. And she started her career as a school teacher. So let me just back that up. We're at a conference to talk about access to capital for black female entrepreneurs. And Maggie Walker is someone we definitely need to be championing and celebrating and honoring her legacy as a woman who was the first of her kind. And see, what, ha what often happens in histories is that we relegate them to just being the first black woman. Madam C.J. Walker was the first self-made female millionaire in U.S. history. Not the first black self-made female millionaire, the first self-made female millionaire in U.S. history, and it's important for us to communicate about her as such, because to do anything otherwise is to do a disservice to the true impact of her legacy, not just in the United States, but abroad. Because you see, Madam Walker and Annie and these others, they, they were doing global business. Madam Walker was doing business in Panama. She was doing business in Haiti. How are you doing business during this time with no internet and a small, you know, small, 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 not fully cultivated and developed postal service? It was about the gift of the hustle. But one thing about these women that, stood, that really held true was Madam Walker was very much so as committed to her community as she was to her company as committed to her community as she was to her company. And one of the things that she was often quoted with saying was, I am not satisfied making money on my own. I will not be satisfied until I have employed thousands of women of my race after me. I am not ashamed of my past. I am not ashamed of my humble beginnings. I got my start by giving myself a start. These are all quotes from her. In her dream, an African man came to her and gave her the formula for her hair solution. As we talk about women in science, technology, engineering, and math, we must also put Madam C.J. Walker in that. To be a botanist is to be a scientist, is it not? You have to have a formula for that hair grow, don't you? So she too is a scientist, as she was a businesswoman. She was writing checks in the, in the first era of the civil rights movement, the one that formed the NAACP, the one that formed the National Urban League. Three minutes. That, that formed the National Urban League. She was writing checks to companies during that time. So let's take a look at where we are today. Walker's legacy in my last 2.52 minutes. <laughs> Walker's legacy was contracted by the Small Business Administration and the National Women's Business Council to do the first ever research study on black female entrepreneurship in the nation. It was called Black Female Entrepreneurship Past and Present Conditions. And we interviewed women across the nation and asked them about where they were. We looked at women in history and we put some of these case studies in there. But we asked women what their issues were. I just want to let it be known that roughly 60% of all black owned businesses are run by a black woman. You cannot have a conversation about black businesses without having the black woman at the table. So if you are not engaging women, you are all the way wrong with how you're approaching engaging the black business community. 45% of all women of color owned businesses are owned by black women. That is the largest share of minority owned businesses are owned by black women. So here we are again, as they say, we're not new to this, we are true to this. We've been in this game. We were building this game. Before there was Mary Kay, there was Madam C.J. Walker. Before there was Estee Lauder, there was Madam C.J. Walker, okay? Before there were some other banks that we're hearing about today, Maggie had her bank that her and her friends and her group and her network and her colleagues put together to solve for the problem of a lack of access to capital. Who in this room is willing to be Maggie today in her community? That is the challenge that all of us have when we go back home. When we did our research, we realized a couple of other things. Number one, we talk a lot about the impacts of segregation, but black businesses flourished during the era of segregation. And unfortunately, I think we're gonna see some reminiscent 
moments as we move into the future of what we used to see of the past. But if you can rest assured that if he got you here, he can bring you through, then you know that black businesses have the potential to flourish yet again during a moment of potential uh, segregation. Does everybody see where I'm going with that? So the possibility of this is not falling on deaf ears and it shouldn't be short-sighted. It's definitely possible to continue to keep doing business amongst people in your community. And by sheer nature, we may have to do that, but we should have already been prepared for that. And then when we looked at why black women were starting companies, one of the things that came very uh, you know, interesting to me, I started my speech by praising the Lord, but spiritual calling was something that black women continued to say. The Lord told me that I ought to go off and start this business. I felt that I had been called to start this business. Whoever you believe in, whatever you believe in, if you intend to be an entrepreneur, I can guarantee you're going to call on that person very often. And I just want to let you know that just like Annie and just like Maggie and just like Madam C.J. Walker, Sarah Breedlove, was not alone as they rested on their knees at night and asked the Lord, how am I supposed to move forward with no access to capital? We complain about no access to capital, but they really had no access to capital. That you all are going to be touched, moved, and inspired by the same personal body evocation that will come about you if this is really something that your life has destined you to do and you will find a way to make a way because that is what we have been doing since we have been here. Thank you so much.